Have you seen the magazine? Yeah, I was on the cover one time. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's cool. I did Dennis Hopper on the cover. Oh, really? Yeah, you know. Mickey Rourke. Mickey? Yeah. Long time ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Poor Mickey. 99. But his face is... They didn't even know that his face is old. They didn't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, told him for James Coburn. Because I did James Coburn also that issue. Yeah. I said, James Coburn. He's going to win the Oscar in a month. And he did. They didn't put him on. They put Mickey. Yeah, because he's got that thing with Japan. How did his face look at the time? I mean, Horrible. Yeah, Mike, uh, Mike Ruiz, the photographer, they airbrushed the shit out of it. Really? How long ago was that? 99. So after Buffalo 66, he still had the... Oh, this is, oh, this, was it after? Yeah, yeah. the cheek. Because he the, came to Buffalo with the things, you know? He's got the nose and the... Why did he do that? I think his face got so fucked up from the boxing. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think he's like... Uh, I think it's hard for him to have gotten as big as he got. I think that fucked him up in the head. And then afterwards, to not be that big fucked him up in the head. So both things... He was not uh, prepared for that Mickey, you know? But he's a beautiful person. Man, the dude has some, some stuff going on that one time, didn't yeah. he? Yeah, oh man. You know when he's doing uh, all those movies, He's you know? the greatest. He had that four or five movie streak, you know? Yeah, and it wasn't even just that the films were successful, it was that he was so good. It was so fresh to see somebody like that. It was almost know? like a James Dean thing, you know what I mean? It was, be- it was even better because it, was, it had never been done, you know? James Dean, his impact came after he died. Mickey was... Yeah. It was happening in the moment. He was really good. Eric Roberts was good at that time, too. Oh, yeah. I, I liked him. Eric about two months ago. How was Eric? I mean, I have to talk about his good stuff, but then he got a little bit defensive, and he's like, well, you know, that's just what a couple of movies I've done. I've done. I'm on a real good TV show right now. That kind of stuff. He you know? talked like that? His wife was there. You know, he, his wife goes everywhere with him. Really? Including Howard Stern show, everything. I didn't know that. The wife does? What's you know, the wife like? Grown, Are they very close? Real close. And, and she calmed them down. It's like, no, 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 but people are interested in stuff like that. People love your old movies. He goes, okay, I know, honey, I know. I'm so sorry. he's talking about his stupid TV show. I mean, in, in my case, I would say, it was from like the early yeah, 80s. Yeah, so yeah. That, they're a little different now. You know, they're a little right. high, more high tech, but that's right. the original jacket. Wow. He's wearing it. I have one. And I'm like, uh, I can't believe it. And we talk, and he's got the same face. He looks exactly like in the picture. And I felt sentimental about it that I chose to race on Michelin tires instead of Dunlop for the film, which was a big problem because uh, Dunlop right now is really the better tire right now in, in this class of racing in a slick, really the best tire. So I was at the real disadvantage, but I, I really was like uh, set on uh, the Michelin tires. So it, it caused a lot of problems with the sponsors in Japan, but... Uh, Oh, was there money involved and stuff too? No, but they gave me, Honda gave me a couple bikes, although they were really fucking jerks about the whole thing. I mean, they give me two fucked up GP bikes that nobody wants anymore from 96. So they're from 96, so they're not going to win any races. And uh, GP is down, you know, in two-stroke. Everybody's going to other bikes now. They give me these two fucked up bikes. They give me no support for parts at all. So I'm scrambling all over the place to get the bikes running. I paint them. They give me no support at the track, no mechanic, and they keep harassing me about the import tax. They made a fucking mistake on their on their import, the way they imported the bikes, and they're calling me every three fucking days. Oh, you need to crate the bikes and send them back, and then we'll send them back to you. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding? I'm in the middle of the film. You think I'm going to trust you to take the bikes that are already established in the movie to fucking Japan? Please, uh, give me a fucking break. They harass me the whole time. Then they they tell me what the credit has to be at the end of the film. And I put uh, Honda Motorcycles Japan, and they... Uh, it had they had it had to say Honda Motorcycles Company Japan or some some right, like right, right. one letter right. thing and big fucking thing. So I had to reshoot the whole credits just so they didn't harass my Jeez. financiers. Uh, who's not gonna know if it, if it even said Honda bikes? It was bizarre, and I gave them a really big credit too. If it was like that was the only contract. You see, here's the thing. When I made Buffalo 66, I had to follow all the the rules of filmmaking uh, because uh, I hadn't understood them fully yet so we get to the end of the movie and i got the fucking dga those scumbags yeah. at the dga and sag and my faggot cameraman lance accord who who shot for three days didn't yeah. even shoot the whole film i need to be called director of photography not cinematographer yeah. everybody harassing me for it took me about a month to finish the fucking credit so Jesus. when i made this film i decided you want to work in my film first of all there's only three people who work in the fucking film three people you want to work in my film you sign a piece of paper that says, if I give you a credit, it's up to me, and what it says is up to me. Otherwise, don't work in my film. 
you want to act in my movie, you give me your home phone number and I'll talk to you directly. If your agent calls me in any way whatsoever, you're fired from the film. That's what happened with Kirsten Dunn. The day before we were about to shoot, suddenly her agent calls me, started harassing me a little, so I just said, fuck you. you know? Really? Mm-hmm. That's cool, man. Somebody should take control like that. Otherwise, have you wa have you seen an album? An album, they put the mixer, the assistant, the engineer, yeah. the engineer assistant. It yeah. goes on and on and on. You watch the end of a film and it's a eight minutes of who put brought the food. The guy who brought the food got paid to bring the food. Why do we have to see his exactly. fucking name in the movie? Right. Credits yeah, are what, so... What's that going to do? Get them more work from uh, regular exactly. people that got a movie do, do you know what? You know what movies... Credits are so that you have a concept and a reference for who did what. You see a cinematographer and you say, Owens Roysman shot the film. Let me see more movies of Owens Roysman. Yeah. You don't see a film and say, Joe Schmo did the fucking food. Let me go see all his movies yeah. that he did the food in. And so and so was an assistant to, right. to him. Supporting actress. Right. Yeah, it's bullshit. So, uh, but uh, to do that, it's very difficult, you know? Anyway, Eric Roberts and Mickey Rourke. I was, I live in, in Little Italy, in New York, and uh, when they were filming Pope of Greenwich Village, I played in a football league, a very violent football league in the neighborhood. And we used to start the games very early in the morning, like seven in the morning. So it's freezing, like, uh, you know, it's late September, it's really cold, a couple degrees out. We're all there in our football uniforms waiting for the, the, the bands to pick us up to take us to the game. And I see Mickey Rourke and, and Eric Roberts, who had just finished a night shoot from Pope of Greenwich yeah. Village. Both of them are fucking tanked. Eric Early Roberts in the morning. Tanked. And they were like talking on the corner and, uh, and, uh, they go, hey, guys, and they point to me, yo, you, you, come here, come here, take some pictures with us. And they were doing, like, press photos for the film or something after shooting. Yo, you, take take some pictures with them. And I remember I was in my football uniform, and, and they were taking pictures together, and I was thinking, I mean, both of them, the, the booze was yeah. unfucking believable Unbelievable booze. But I was really a big fan, both of them ready, because Eric had done Star 80, and Mickey was, you know, my yeah. idol from yeah. Rumblefish already. So I'm there with the two of them and I'm and I didn't want to say anything like, you know, I'm your fan or anything cuz I knew they wanted like a real neighborhood kit for the photo. So instead of being like a fan or or like an actor or anything like that, I just was like, uh, all right. And like some crazy kid from the neighborhood. And I told him, he was fucking they, drunk." And man. they just dug it. They like dug it. Nice. Yo, yo, he's real. He's real. Yeah, They're like yeah. telling Telling the yeah, cameraman. Because, because Eric was so into the research and stuff. Yeah. Because he was telling me that all these Italian guys like mama's boys. Yeah. Now, because he was written as a top kind of a guy. Yeah, yeah. And he said, no, I want a real mama's boy. Yeah. You know? And those were the guys yeah. he was looking for. And he, he really looked at all kinds of people. His, his, so. his thing in Pope is that it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous. He was good back then. He was going to start hating. What ha then how does somebody have that moment? And he's looking great and running the train. Yeah, but how does somebody have that moment and go away from that moment? Well, he told me he didn't have an agent at the time. He just had like a manager who didn't know what he was doing. So if I had to do it over again, I'd go with one of the big agents or something. What does that have to do? And he was on like serious like drugs and stuff like that, you know? I mean, he had problems with women and one after the other. Getting married and getting divorced. Do you know that he dated Sandy Dennis? And that's whose house he left when he crashed in his car. And did she die or something? Yeah, she died, yeah. yeah. How does he look now, Eric? He looks good. He does? Because he's into this whole really natural food thing. Is he sober now? Yeah, oh, totally. And his wife has like a natural food company, a catering company, and they're right. trying to do it for the movie sets now. Really? Because worse than an ex-addict. So he's like real healthy, you know? He's How's the face now. look? Good. He looks know? like Eric Roberts. Oh yeah, he's still got... Well, his face was mutilated, you know. You know that, right? He did a film called King of the Gypsies. Right afterwards, he was dating Sandy Dennis, and they lived upstate New York somewhere, and he came out of her house drunk, plowed into a tree down her driveway, and mutilated his face and his fingers. Did you notice his hand? It's one of his hands is like this. And if you see him in film, he does a lot of, like, yeah. hand things. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's really a fucked up hand, and it's, it gives him a very idiosyncratic uh, yeah, charm. Yeah, those early 80s movies work for him. Yeah, they really do. But his face really got fucked up, his nose. When he did King of the Gypsies, he's a fucking beauty. I mean, a fucking beauty. Yeah. A beauty. Like you've never seen. You know, he told me he turned down um, Velvet Goldmine. Because they wanted, that Todd Haynes wanted him to play the older version of that kid. Right. Because he looks like, you know, yeah. like the older, older, fucked up, there he is. Yeah. You know? 
but he turned it down and he said he should have really done it. Because he now, said he should have done Because now he's getting into like Spun, all those art movies now. Yeah. Because he's got a steady TV gig now. Is he in Spun? Yeah. Him Spun was Nicky. terrible. Yes, I, I don't see what's, you know, Jonas Ackerlund, you know, big music video director. But Who gives so, a fuck? I mean, yeah. you watch it and I'm like, well, yeah, but so what? That's a terrible movie. You know? Who Who's the guy, the main guy? That's the Pope, uh, uh, Tyler Shire's son. Jason, Jason Swartz. Yeah, yeah, he's He was terrible. good in the Wesley Anderson movie. Yeah, he's a kid. Anybody's good as a kid. What do you think Macaulay Culkin can do now? Nothing. Yeah. So awful. Did you see his movie, uh, Monster? No. See, I knew those guys back in New York. So yeah. No, I mean, I, I went to clubs and they were, they were always giving me a hard time getting in and stuff. Really? Yeah. But when I went to New York, I started at Neighborhood Playhouse and stuff. Neighborhood Playhouse was on 54th? Oh, yeah. You know, I used, I'll tell you a good story. I used to live there across the street, 333 East 54th Street, with a girl, with a woman, an older woman. When I first came to New York, I lived on the Bowery for maybe six months. Then I got my apartment on Elizabeth Street. While I was, when I, to get my apartment on the Elizabeth Street, the landlord, I had to give him $2,000 key money, and part of that included him gutting the apartment and doing a basic renovation. So I made a deal with him, no, don't do the renovation, just gut it and put in like the plumbing and the electricity because I want to do a special thing in there. While he was doing that, for a month, I lived with this woman that I sort of, not dating, but I knew this woman on 54th Street mm. at 333, a couple buildings away from Club El Morocco. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I would see all the time James Remar at the neighborhood yeah, yeah, yeah. He speaks Japanese, you know. Really? Yeah, because he's married to a Japanese woman. He had just done uh, Warrior. No, it was before he did Warriors. He yeah. was just getting ready to do yeah. Warriors. And he was there. He's an interesting actor, though. He's, he ha he's another one. He had a moment. How do you go from that? Remember Olivia? in the Cotton Club, he played the Dutchman yeah. Schultz. I mean, how does Coppola cast a fairly young guy to play? And he was good in that, too. He's I thought he was an old man. Yeah, he's great. But he's, he's actually only a few years out of school. But how so. could he, s he. He hasn't been in one interesting thing in 10 years. Why? What happens? He's got like that villain. How does he, he look like? You know, Can a guy really like that like. work? Do they have money? Are they poor? Are they? I think he makes money because he does TV series and stuff. He does. Yeah. Jesus. Does Eric like doing TV? Is his I'm show sure. good? No, I haven't really seen it. But he's with Andy Dick and. Who's Andy Dick? That comedian. Ugh. But it's like one of these comedy Eric sitcoms. Eric Roberts and Andy Dick. Well, he's like a boss of a uh, like a news show, news pro, you know place. Yeah, so he's playing, playing kind of a straight guy. Is he making guy. money doing that? Yeah, I think so. Did he tell you anything? The incest? No. The sex? Did he tell you? I wasn't allowed to talk about him about any of that stuff. So there was a like a preface. You were not oh, yeah. allowed to say, did you fuck your oh, yeah. sister? No. Even on Howard Stern, he won't say anything. Does Howard ask him? Yeah, right? he does. What does he say? Howard's about the only guy who can get away with any of that stuff. Howard says, did you fuck Julia? No, he just says, you know, why, why wouldn't she talk to you? You know, she's a, she's a... Because Howard doesn't kind of like... Julie. And what, what does she, he say? So he says, could she not be grateful that you put her in a first movie? And he did more than that. He was bringing her all around New yeah. York City. You know. And but he is, told me, I think he said that in Howard too, is that, uh, you know, what a lot of people don't know is that I hardly know Julia. I didn't even grow up with her. I only met her once when, when she was like 17 years old. I helped her out a little bit, so I hardly know her. Maybe that's why he fucked her. He didn't know her. But Julia and Lisa Roberts, they still to this day don't even talk to him. Both they, of them? They, did he they, fuck the other one too? They're, they're together. They live together and... What does she look like? She's ugly. She, Same parents though, or she just got the yeah, bad genes? Yeah, she's Eric and Julia look alike. She, why didn't he grow up with them if they had Because the they got parents? divorced or something. And he went with the father and they went with the mother? So yeah. did he fuck Julia, do you think, or no? And then she no, freaked I don't know out and that. realized, did probably he raped her one day. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and she won't talk about him at all. No. Poor but, guy, uh, you know? Yeah. They sh she should forgive him though, whatever he... It's a sad thing, because now she's like the biggest actress and kind of sold out really, you know what I mean? She's I mean, Erin Brockovich is considered a great movie for her, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's about, that's about, that's Steven Sonnenberg sucks anyway. He sucks. He's this kind of guy, he's sort of like... There's a whole group of guys who pretend to be making special films, just yeah. real players. So it's that whole new American young director? Yeah, like Wes Anderson Wes sucks. Wes Anderson. Uh, Spike Jones Spike sucks. Jones, David O. Russell, all the music video directors. Yeah. Spike that. Jones sucks bad. James Gray sucks. But, but Spike Jones was a biker, you know what I mean? BMX biker and he, he was an editor for a magazine. Listen, and then I he know got Spike into... Jones since he's 11 years old. Let me tell you what. He was a rich Jew from the Upper East Side who was fascinated with Negroes. Is he from Vermont or something? Listen to me, okay? He's a rich Jew from New York who saw a bunch of 
black and Hispanics and wanted to be like them. So he sort of buddied up on the skateboard BMX bike scene. He's embarrassing. As a BMXer, he's embarrassing as a skateboarder. He met Kim Gordon through some of the Beastie Boy people, and he got to sort of co-direct a video with her, and that's how it all started. He's the biggest fraud out there. Yeah, but his movies, though. listen, Adam watch, watch. was good, though. Wait a second. You have to do what you have to do. Nick Cage is good. You don't understand. What you have to do is you have to separate filmmaking from screenplay and performance. You have to separate filmmaking from exactly. screenplay and performance. Exactly. As a filmmaker, he is nothing. A zero. He's brought nothing to the page, brought nothing to the picture. If you bring him to a party and there's 10 interesting people there, if I'm with Johnny Ramone, John Frusciante, uh, 10 of my friends, and Spike is there, which has happened a hundred times. He's the least interesting. He's the person who doesn't know anything. He's the person who doesn't say anything funny, interesting, intelligent. He has no point of view. All he does is want to find out what you think so he's sure about what he should be doing. What do you think? What do you think? He's a, a pig piece of shit. Him and his fucking milk ex-wife. Are they divorced? She's been blowing around town for two years now. I think at, finally he's had enough. I mean, she's, you know, if you want to fuck Sophia, all you got to do is say, hey, baby. So I don't know. I don't know what he's doing. You Sophia likes, Sophia likes any guy who has something that she wants. If she wants to be a filmmaker, she'll fuck a filmmaker. If she wants to be a photographer, she'll fuck a photographer. If she wants to be in fashion, she'll fuck somebody in fashion. She's only attracted to people who have something that she can take from them. And she's really a parasite like that. Just like her fat pig father was. You're right about the whole difference in the performance and the directing. Because Filmmaking the, has there's nothing. so many movies that I like. I have to say I like just because I loved... Harvey Keitel in the whole movie. I've been in, I've been movie. in films where the director was nothing but an interference to the film. Does that mean and Abel Farrar movies? To be honest with you, I mean I've interviewed Abel. To be honest with you, Abel Farrar was on so much crack when I did the funeral. Not only on the set, right? He was never on the set. Yeah, he was in right. my room trying to pickpocket. So. We'll just do this uh, thing here. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. First of all, were you an outsider when you and you're growing up? I know, growing up in Buffalo, New York, you have some resentment from the way you're brought up by your parents and so forth, as seen in Buffalo '66. Buffalo '66 is n not an autobiographical film, quite uh, what, what you may think. Uh, it's a conceptual, fictional tale uh, that has nothing to do with me or my life there. Okay, then how was your childhood? Calling the film autobiographical is a way of diminishing the fact that I wrote it, directed it, starred in it, produced it, and did the music to it, as if because I was born in Buffalo, the film made itself. You understand? Okay. But is your childhood and your parents something my, that... My childhood was complex and difficult to describe, but it was probably a bit more brutal and severe than most kids. Uh, for several reasons, but nothing that uh, that I dwell on as an adult. Okay, but you were into sports, which I, which I didn't know until I met you. So you couldn't have been that I much of an outsider, very, right? Very active in sports. Yes. So you had the whole team thing going, or were you more of an individual? Well, I was I was into the you know I played team sports, but I uh, I needed to be the person on the team who had a lot of impact on the team. You know. The go-to guy. Uh, the go-to guy. I liked to pitch in baseball. I was a quarterback in football, and I was a goalie in hockey. You know, as far as individual sports, all I did individual sports was race motorcycles. Okay. You got into motorcycles after most of your team sport playing at school, right? Uh, no, I got into motorcycles very young. I built a... I put a... Me and my uncle installed a gasoline lawnmower engine on my bicycle and that was uh, the beginning of my flat tracking days. Right. Did you happen to be just really good at it and you liked it a lot or did you have to really work on it to become... Uh, it, you know, I have some natural ability but I was certainly always the hardest working person on my team. Always, by a lot. Always very hard working. How old were you, first of all, when you got into the Kenny Roberts team? I was not on Kenny Roberts' team. I was racing a Kenny Roberts RZ350. I see. Yeah. 
When did you start racing on the professional level? Well, I started racing uh, very young, but uh, I was professional in my early 20s. And uh, what, you, you did it for how long? I stopped racing when I was about 33 years old. So about seven years ago? Yeah, just, years ago. It just got too dangerous, or? No, it's just very time-consuming and expensive, and uh, no, it's not, you know what I mean? It's not too dangerous. But it's not something you can make money on, huh? Unless you're the very best. I never had the chance to... I never had the time or the chance to make money at it, but I definitely uh, feel that uh, there's definitely a lot of money in that sport. Mm -hmm. One wants to go to the world-class level, there's definitely a lot of money to be made. Right. Well, how was your relationship with friends and so forth? You know, growing up and now, I know you have some very close friends now, but uh, did you did you always have a lot of really good friends, you know? No, no, no. I had always just one or two. I was very much into criminal things, so I always had one or two friends in my criminal circle. Oh, yeah? Criminal is in yeah. what? Just uh, like petty theft and so forth? No, big theft. Armed robbery, auto theft, you know, mm. real things. What was the most uh, time you had to do? Uh, I never got arrested as an adult. I was only arrested as a child, so I had to go six months to a reformatory school. Oh, really? But uh, you never had temptations to get into, do any kind of uh, criminal things past, you know, your teen years? Well, when I was into hip-hop, there were definitely uh, guns around and gang fights and things. But I, I'm not, uh, you know, my... my my position in the world is to be progressive, not destructive. When I was a child, I didn't understand that, so part of my criminal act was, in my mind, diluted to a productive act. I thought I... I didn't understand that I was having a negative impact on the world. The minute I understood that, I never had interest in crime again. See, the reason why I ask that is because to be successful, well, to a point, even in criminal things, you have to show some talent. I mean, I was in crime. I showed my best talent. Really? Wow. In in what in particular? What, what areas? Breaking I mean, in? Uh, in breaking and entering, and like uh, breaking and entering, I'm untouchable. In uh, vandalizing uh, vending machines and mm. things like that, I'm untouchable. In auto theft, I'm the greatest. I could steal a car better than anyone I've ever known in my life. If you could pick a car, you could probably do a pretty good job now, huh? Let's just say if somebody's car is broken and they or they lost their keys, I'm definitely the guy to uh, help out. Wow. Okay. Cool. Now I just want to get into Brown Bunny, you know, which is the main focus of this piece here. Having done my research, I think critics way overreacted with the film. It wasn't finished, right? Basically, especially at con. Well, you know, only one newspaper and one critic came that strong against the film. Mm -hmm. You're forgetting the other 80 critics who said the film was fantastic, and you're forgetting that I got the longest standing ovation of any filmmaker at the Cannes Film Festival at the end of my movie, and you're forgetting that I got a standing ovation at the end of my press conference. You're only reacting to some of the hearsay about the heckling and, uh, you know, uh, the personal reaction that I get at film festivals. So the certain international writers who got to publish this stuff internationally were the ones that said that Vincent Gallo got booed. Bef but basically it was before the press conference, but after... It was only one news magazine called Screen International run by a faggot who has a personal vendetta against me. And he put it on the National Wire so a lot of press people just are lazy and they pick up things from the wire. As far as that whole thing about your speech, that bullshit thing about you apologize and all that... I never apologize for anything in my life. I mean, you're, you're part of the film, right? I mean, uh, the idea that I would apologize for anything is ridiculous. Right, and to vow never to make another film, that's ridiculous. But uh, besides, Gilles Jacob, for him to have taken your film to Cannes, he obviously saw the film and thought it was good enough to be in Cannes, so how could all this... It's just ridiculous, um... I don't know why... Ebert decided to go against the festival this year, but I think it was a... Uh a bizarre political thing having something to do with the critics trying to put a lot of pressure on the Cannes Film Festival to show more mainstream American movies or something. What's the best creative outlet for you? Is it the writing, the acting, or painting, or... or everything? I like fixing things. 
You have everything? I like to fix things. Fix things. So w whether it be what? Cars. Oh, electronic. I oh, I see. This film, Brown Bunny, do you think the Japanese will get it? Because they're obviously very, very fond of you, and uh, they seem to get you. I don't know. It's, I think it's number one indie film there right now. Okay. Uh -huh. Do you relate at all to people like Dennis Hopper, who was, who was also uh, persecuted at one point with the last movie? I don't relate to any drug addict or alcoholic. Oh, okay. Great answer. I like it. But you're a workaholic, and how's uh, Brown Bunny coming right now? Everything's young. Done, huh? Everything, yeah. Okay. When did you decide to become an actor? I never wanted to be an actor, but I decided to become a movie star. Mm -hmm. Very young. Because you wanted to become the most famous person in the world, right? Right. And that's still, a, that's still a, the number one goal for you? No. Not anymore? Uh-uh. What is your goal now? To stay alive. And do whatever it takes? Which, obviously, you're very successful in acting and directing. Um, I'm not so concerned about anything but staying alive. So the whole... I'm sick and not dying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the whole careerism is not that important to you, as long as you have a good time doing it? I never really had a career, you know. I'm not really a career person, but... Um, you know, I'm, I'm just a... A working guy. Okay. Working class guy. I really am. I mean, you know me now, you know. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit more about the whole motivation behind your... You have a tendency, it seems like, to, to really become uh, obsessed with your work once you have plenty of work to do. Talk about the, the motivation you talk to me about. You know, the being, you, know you don't want to be penniless and you, the money motivation. Uh... I mean, fame is a byproduct now, ironically. You know, your whole main motivation is money and to get paid. When I, when I said that, like, let, let's be clear on what I meant. When I said my main motivation was money, I didn't mean that I'm greedy and I only want money. What I meant was that when I'm working, it's a job. Everybody does their job. You know, I'm no different than the factory worker. If the factory worker was not getting paid, he would not go to the factory. Right. If I was not getting paid, I would not make movies. I would not act in movies. Mm -hmm. I would do something else. If right. I was a multi-millionaire, I wouldn't be doing uh, movies. You know, and I mean, just try to understand that, that I don't think that I'm an artist. I'm just a working person. And... This is some of the work that's been granted to me in, in the world, and it's, it's a good paying job, and there's a lot of advantages that fit my psychology, my emotional life, and my lifestyle. Really? You don't consider yourself an artist in, at all? No, artists do things without purpose. Everything I do is with a purpose. That main purpose being so you don't become homeless? That's, that's you know, part of it. Mm-hmm. And also, what about the proving your parents wrong that uh, you 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 will amount to something? Uh, you in know, fame. that may have motivated me earlier on in my life, but it's not a driving force anymore. And fame was an earlier driving force, wasn't it? Uh, not fame in the way that that is traditional to other people. I mean, uh, my concept of fame may be a little unique in that way, uh, because it's it's to have impact, to have the power or the position able to manipulate and control the world in the direction that I wish it would go. So it wasn't for personal, it wasn't so that everybody loved me, it was so that everybody gave me the responsibility to control things. Just like the pressure that I enjoyed of being the quarterback or the pitcher in baseball. He was a way of being the pitcher on the team. You right. understand? Right. But you mentioned right just now that um, if you were, if you had millions, which you do, you know, um, you wouldn't be making films. That's why I announced my retirement uh, recently. Oh, really? So you're only going to make movies when you really feel like it? I have no plans to work in any 
way whatsoever mm -hmm. after today. Yesterday was my last day at work, and I have no plan to work again in any shape or form. How can some movie company coax you into directing or acting in another movie? I don't know. It would be a unique... Uh, it would be a unique moment. I don't know how they would do it. Really? Tell, tell me more about this announcement you made. Maybe with a chick somehow or something. If there was a certain chick that I wanted to meet or something like that. I don't know. Uh-huh. So highly motivated by girls. So certain filmmakers or actors must have inspired you at some point to try this profession. Working with one of them wouldn't uh, get you into working? Um, I'm not interested in working with people that I like in my childhood, you know. I leave that for people like Johnny Depp or somebody like that, you know, the people who still would do a movie with Marlon Brando or something stupid like that. You mm. know? Do you think that could be disappointing in some ways? Like people that you looked up to and they're actually very human when you... No, it wouldn't be disappointing because I'd have no expectation. It would just be dull because I would not be working with people who were looking to do the best work of their life and willing to do whatever it took to do that. Right. But uh, there wasn't a turning point for you at some point where you said, no, I want to be an actor like this guy, whoever, Montgomery Clift or well, Marlon Brando. I never, I never really liked anybody in that way. No, really? Hmm, okay. I just want to touch on Buffalo 66. Were you surprised at all by the reception of it? Because I think overall it was very well received, wasn't it? You know, to tell you the truth, I was a little surprised because I felt I was making an avant-garde film that would have no audience. I was very surprised that people were relate to, could relate to it in a very simple, basic way. Right. So, yes, I was a little surprised. But some people say that the success of Buffalo 66 got to your head and so forth, and therefore Brown Bunny became a little bit more self-involved. Uh, success from Buffalo 66? Yeah, it's only the words me, of let people. Let me describe to you the reality, okay? Because mm -hmm. that's the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my life. I made Buffalo 66 for $1.2 million, of which I took no salary. In Hollywood terms, Buffalo 66 is a flop. Do you understand? It made a couple million dollars domestically, and nobody in America knows or gives a shit who I was. <laughs> okay. Nobody ever offered me any big job after Buffalo 66. No couple picture deal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It was extremely hard for me to get financing for my next film, and I never was offered any other directing or acting role. So I don't know what you're talking about success going to my head. But in Hollywood terms, Buffalo 66 was a flop. Okay. I think that meant because the critically it was thought of as you're a very promising uh, Buffalo, talent. Buffalo 66 never won one film festival or critic prize in its career, so I don't know what you're talking about again. I think you're uh, over-embellishing what you think my perception is of my own work. Mm -hmm. Buffalo 66, on a critical level, had very mixed reviews and was not in a unanimous way hailed in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. I'm not Sofia Coppola, you know, I don't know how to make films that tickle people in the right places. Okay. Is it true that you lost money on that because of the you wanted to make uh, do certain things with the... I lost money on Buffalo 66 and I lost money on the Brown Bunny because once I take the job, I'm stupid enough to use some of my own money to mm -hmm. make the job as good as possible. Right. That's different when it's a film that you're hired to act in, right? When you're asked to act in a movie, you take the best paying job available. The highest pay. Right. Very simple. The highest pay. Right. If there were two movies, one was for $200,000 and one was for $150,000. The $200,000 movie was the worst movie that was ever going to be made, and the $150,000 movie would be the best movie that would ever be made. I would take the $200,000 movie. Really? So even if, if it's the $100,000 a Martin Scorsese film... I wouldn't work for Martin Scorsese for $10 million, but... Really? You don't like him? Not at all. He hasn't made a good film in 25 years, you know. But it's still uh, Maurice Scorsese. Exactly my point. That kind of thinking is why the world works. What do you mean he's Maurice Scorsese? He hasn't made a fucking good film in 25 years. Okay. <laughs> why would I want to work with a has-been, a rich, controlling, egomaniac has-been, who is not interested in doing whatever he has to do to make the best film of his life? Right. Why would I want to work with that person? 
Okay. And who, who else are has-beens, in your opinion, the top names? Well, I mean, I don't want to call people who have been, but I don't want to work with people past their prime. Man. Right. Coppola. Martin Scorsese would get, uh, he would get the same attention as anybody else. Mm. How much, how many days, when do I start? That's the only questions I would ask. I'm very honored that you're very upfront with me about all your... I love the way you're honest about what, everything you say. It really is very refreshing. And I appreciate that. I'm enjoying this very much. But um, as far as your acting method, you learned it basically from just... You never really studied with anybody in particular, right? No, I never studied. But what I do, and I do this as a director and a cinematographer and a photographer and everything I do, I don't have a set technique. But, and instead, uh, I invent a new technique for every job. So each time I do an acting role, I come up with a different technique for that performance, and then I forget it and start from scratch the next time. Really? Uh-huh. As far as, like, when you're acting, do you, like, memorize all your lines by rote or any kind of special things like that, or...? Sometimes I memorize my lines, and sometimes I work very loose. Sometimes I stay right out in the script, sometimes I improvise the whole thing. So it's always different, you know? Like I said, I, I try to invent a technique that works best with the job that I'm doing. Right. Not a technique familiar and easy for me. I would have thought directing and uh, everything else you do in the movies, I mean, you, from scoring and editing, those would be much more difficult because... For instance, being a cinematographer, you have to know framing and lenses and so forth. How did you learn all that, not, not going to film school? Uh, you'd, be, you'd be surprised at how little people know who do those jobs and how quickly you can learn what they know and know more than them. I know more, than any, I know more about lenses than any cinematographer I've ever met in my life. Right. I know more about taking apart and repairing a camera body than any cinematographer I've ever met in my life. Mm. And the reason I do is because I put the time in. I don't learn what is the protocol and then stop there. Mm. I continue to learn as much as I can so that I have a full understanding of everything I do. And that's what, you know, you don't really learn in, in traditional education. But you're kind of a natural too, though, I would have thought. I don't know, but I certainly have my own opinions about why I use the tools that I use, and they're based on my own experience, not on what the general perception is. I mean, you say you're not an artist, you clearly are, though. I mean, well, okay, well, you've already explained that, that, uh, you know, you have a purpose and so forth, but uh, in my opinion, you're, you're very, very talented. Oh, thank you. I've read some places where you've talked about your dislike for foreigners, Europeans, and French and Italians, and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is that just a very general, out of context stuff that people have taken out again? Uh, what did I say about them? Like calling them, calling them like creepy French, uh, you know, Italians are animals and that kind of. And, I, you know. I don't. I mean, I'm not. A, you know, the Japanese uh, seem to be very fascinated with Europe. I'm not. I consider it a, a fermented, regressive part of the world, and I don't think of Europe as a as a profound. Uh, exciting place. I think of it as a place where people shove as much coffee, cheese, wine, and tobacco into their bodies as they can while they prance around in designer clothes, chatting each other up in the piazza. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm not interested in Europe. And the cinema culture out of Europe is, uh, is very uninspired. Again, you're, you're one of these guys that, that don't see the point of going abroad and vacationing, right? If you have a vacation, you'd rather just stay home and... I wouldn't think of traveling for vacation. Travel would not be part of my concept. A vacation would be to sit in my bed with a bunch of junk food while a beautiful girl blew me while I watch TV. You know, that's my dream. Right. You have in some of your statements or some of the stuff you've written, whether it's in humor or not, you've talked about fags, this and that, or Jew, this and that, or... I totally understand it's all, you know, in certain contexts, but I'm surprised you haven't lashed out about Japs, this and that, and whatever, you know what I mean? About Japanese. You're surprised I haven't said what, Jap? Because there are certain things in Japan that's pretty creepy too, you know what I mean? Let me explain quickly 
why I've said things like that. Okay. So have a better understanding. When I use words like faggot or Jew, gays and Jews see themselves as a special interest group needing special attention in America, where they, they feel like they deserve, they need to have special policies directed to cater exactly to their wishes and needs. So what I try to do when I say things like that is to diminish that concept. In other words, I'm not against gays or Jews. I just want to feel free to not have to tiptoe around their ego, their sensitivity, and their special interest agenda. The Japanese don't see themselves as a special interest group, so I, I have no reaction to them in that way. Do you also say like niggers or wops or frogs? Of course, I always call my pa- I call my parents grief balls. So what? What about niggers? What? What does all that shit mean? It doesn't mean anything. I know. This is bullshit. Right. Only faggots and Jews get upset about it because they're so self centered But do you say niggers and that? Say much worse than much worse than that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did you first go to Japan with Buffalo 66? No, I went to Japan as a young kid, you know. It seems like you had a fondness for Japan as soon as you got there, it seems like. I had to be in Japan when you were do- promoting Buffalo 66, and they all loved you there, and and you it looked like you were having a great time, too. I was having a great time, but I have to tell you the truth. I like it less and less now. Really? Why? Uh... There's something there that I saw the last couple times that I didn't really like, you know? Did you feel like they were using you a little bit? You became uh, yeah, part I of the... Yeah, uh, like they were, they take advantage and like, um, the politeness is insincere. It's just a sort of, it's sort of formal, but they're really not very polite. Right. In a way, in my opinion, it's like, as far as from a business standpoint, because you're everyone likes you and you're you know everyone really thinks you're hip and cool you know different than like the way they look at Johnny Depp or something because once you become like a real hip guy over there you become like this he becomes just a part of a business oh let's use him because uh, it's no different than here after a while you know what I mean well I don't know I, I've never really been in that situation I don't work in Japan so I don't know because I'd imagine you'll be going there soon right no oh you're not going this time no, I don't think I'm going to go to Japan again. I don't think so. No, really? Why? Is that is that like a decision you've made that uh, you don't want to... No, since I'm not working anymore, I have no reason to go to Japan. Really? So this is not like no Sean Penn thing where he announced he's retired and it seems like he's working more than ever now. Is it you really don't uh, think you work anymore? Like I said, I mean, you know, I don't know exactly what the future is going to bring. Today, the way that I feel today is that I don't want to work anymore, and that's how I feel today. I don't know. Okay. Now, by the way, whereabouts are you when you're driving right now? What did you say? You're driving home right now, right? Yes. Whereabouts are you now? I'm just outside of L.A. Oh, so you're, you're driving all the way back to New York now? Yeah. Wow. How many days does that take? Uh, it can take as little as three, but I'm going to spread it out over about five or six. Are you going to stay in motels and stuff? Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, um, how about this um, whole thing that a lot of people like to say that you're a man who hates many? Is that a bunch of bullshit again, or is that, is that somewhat, there's some truth to it? They say that I'm what? Man who hates many. A man who hates many? <laughs> I don't hate anybody. Because you lash out at certain celebrities and so forth, and... People like those bits that you, when you go off on rants of certain actors. I don't know. I mean, uh, one time somebody said how much I, you know, I was listening to the radio and I kept saying, oh, I, did, I hate that song, I hate that song, and was flipping through the radio and somebody said, you hate everything. And then I started to laugh because I thought, wow, I own 20,000 albums. I paid up to $5,000 for one album. This asshole that I'm driving with in the car owns six CDs, mm. and I'm the one accused of hating everything. You know, I, there's many, many more things that I like than things that I don't like right. anymore. What you said to me when I first met you, I think is very true, that because you don't have, like, publicists and so forth, and managers, a lot of um, the writers in papers and magazines, 
take the liberty of putting in whatever they feel like to sell more papers. Well, that is okay, because it really doesn't matter in the end anyway, does it? All this stuff about you saying negative stuff about this director, these actors, everybody talks like that. It's just that you're honest to talk about it in front of people, you know? Well, the good news is that it all doesn't matter in the end anyway, does it? Yeah, okay. Is it complimentary to have uh, gays or queers think you're attractive? Uh, I mean, it's no more, no less complimentary than having anybody else think I'm attractive. Because I read that piece where you're joking, you know, when you wrote something in some magazine where all the queers were, you thought you were attractive and all that. Gay men don't flirt with me in any way, you know. It's, I, I haven't heard a gay man uh, say anything complimentary about me and the way that I look in many, many years. So I don't know. I don't think I have a lot of gay appeal. Okay. All right. Would you say you're a very lonely man? I'm, you know, probably more lonely than others, but uh, I'm not plagued by loneliness. Is it safe to say that your motto is trust no one still? Uh, don't. You know, I rely on myself, and that's, that's all I can, uh, that's the way that I feel most comfortable. You never saw Julian Schnabel's uh, Basquiat, right? No, I never saw it. You were never asked to be in the movie or anything? No. People must have known that you were close to Basquiat, right? Well, who cares? I mean, I was close to a lot of people. But uh, you wouldn't have necessarily done the movie just because you knew Basquiat, right? I mean, it, was, uh, it would be totally a money I issue. I would not have done that movie. Right. Do you have a girlfriend right now? No. Are you attracted to beauty or brains or personality or whatever? Uh, because you told me that you were, you were really into the whole relationship, the building the relationship thing. I'm definitely more attracted, uh, more drawn to the way a girl is as a person. And physically, I'm probably more attracted to the way she smells than the way she looks. Really? So you don't have... Are you one of these guys that don't have to have sexual days? No, I have to come every day a couple times, but I don't have to do that with another person. Oh, I see. So masturbation and whatever. Whatever it takes. <laughs> okay. Uh, would you change your ways or your personality for a girl that you really were attracted to? Oh, well, I think that you have to adjust, you know, to... Uh to the other person uh, if you want to have a relationship, but I wouldn't become a different person to satisfy another person. But um, things have changed a little bit since I last saw you a week ago because now you really feel like you don't want to ever work again, right? So in that sense, many things have, will be different now, wouldn't it, from now on? What, what is different? Well, because you won't be such a workaholic anymore. So, because you said one of the reasons why I'm you're... workaholic, but I just won't be doing jobs for other people. I'll be working on the things that I enjoy. And I don't enjoy uh, making movies, you know? I'll be a workaholic, but I'll be doing the things that I enjoy. What about music? Do you think you'll continue to do music? Yeah, I'll mess around with music. Uh -huh. and you won't, but you won't paint anymore? Um, if I feel like it, I will. Right. But I won't do it for, for any other reason than for myself. Right. But you're self-sufficient. Uh, financially, you're, you're quite wealthy now, right? Yeah, I'm a multimillionaire. And tell me again how you got that way, because, you know, you told me you had $80,000 of your own money in the bank when you... Hard work. Hard work is all it takes. Hard work. But is it a matter of, um, you know, learning how to invest your money in the right places? Hard work. Hard work. Because I'd imagine a lot of your collections is worth a lot of money, right? Uh, yeah. Do you get jealous at all of uh, other, other people? Not at all, huh? Now, what would you like to say to the Japanese audience who will be watching Brown Bunny? Uh, if any of the Japanese girls want to send me topless photos of themselves, I'd love to get them. What kind of girls do you like? All girls. Young all, girls? All girls. Age doesn't matter? Uh, to VincentGallo.com. Topless photos to VincentGallo.com. I'll be thrilled. Okay, I'll, I'll put that in.